All right, this is live. Welcome, welcome. You're at uh, Optimizing Network Performance for EC2 Instances. Um, I'm Nick Matthews. Uh, we're also, I've got Vesh here. He's going to come up later. Um, so yeah, I'm Nick. Uh, my sort of day job is I, I work with our partners, uh, primarily the networking partners, a lot of them that do um, you know, routers and firewalls, intrusion protection, those kinds of devices, and they usually run in EC2 instances, so I spend actually a lot of time with those, those folks figuring out how to optimize network performance for uh, things that are often like choke points, um, as well as there's a lot of customers that have networking performance questions and issues, so I spend a lot of time uh, working with customers, so I'm really interested to hear you guys' feedback as well on this. Um, let's go ahead and get started. So, you know, one thing, I've been a network engineer for, for a while, uh, and what's sort of fun, funny for me doing this, this cloud business is that uh, a lot of people on AWS don't really understand networking deeply, like they're, maybe they're not infrastructure people. Uh, and on top of that, network performance, even by itself, is, a, is sometimes a bit of a dark art. Um, you know, packets come in, packets go out, you're not really sure, like, if it's, is it the bottleneck? Um, any network engineers in the room? All right, all the front row guys, right? <laughs> Um, you know, we spend a lot of time in the networking world talking about like mean time to innocence, right? Like how do you prove it's not the network uh, is typically what we have to do. Um, and so, you know, how do we do this in, on Amazon EC2? How do we do it, in, you know, on AWS? What does that look like? Uh, what are the components and what do we really need to accomplish here? Uh, so we're going to do this in a, in a couple different steps. Um, so first is like just the basic performance concepts, um, things that you really need to know and really need to understand. Uh, and then we'll go into some of the AWS specific implementation details. So we've got a set of features uh, that can help optimize and uh, increase network performance. Uh, we've also got some, some tips and some uh, help on how to build an architecture on AWS that's gonna give you the best network performance for your use case. And then we'll sort of wrap it up with talking about how to test it and what you wanna think about uh, to actually put this thing to, to use. So to start off, let's, let's talk about the concepts. Uh, I would say this is probably the most important because um, I think when I talk with people, I feel like this is the stuff that, that usually makes the most difference is understanding uh, sort of like the global concept. We can probably even call it universal because I'm pretty sure the things we've sent out to space are running like IP version four and TCP and stuff. So I'm pretty sure we can call this a universal concept. Um, and there are things like bandwidth. Uh, this is what a lot of people focus on, uh, even though it's actually not usually the most important. Uh, they want to know like, you know, if you have a, a, a one gigabit per second direct connect um, or a 10 gigabit per second capable instance, those are bandwidths. Um, there's also latency. Latency is a sort of fancy word for time, right? It's how long does it take for the packet from one point of the network to go another point of the network. Um, we usually call this, you know, the half round trip time, or just from go from one place to another. But usually we're going to measure round trip time. So from, from me to you and you and back, or we'll also call that the RTT, and we'll talk about that a little bit. Uh, and both of those actually play into your throughput. So throughput is what you're actually getting out of the network. Uh, so if you've done file transfers and you're seeing a certain amount of megabits per second or something like that, uh, that's your actual effective throughput, uh, which differs often from your bandwidth. It's actually uh, really hard, and part of some of the dark art of networking performance is figuring out how to get the most out of your bandwidth uh, to get the highest throughput. Uh, another concept that's a little bit less common, uh, but still important, is jitter. So jitter is the variance and delay that you get, you're getting uh, on your packets. So if I'm sending packets every 20 milliseconds and you're receiving packets on the dot every 20 milliseconds, then you've got no variance, you've got zero jitter. However, if I'm sending packets every 20 milliseconds and you're getting them one in 50 milliseconds, one every 20 seconds, milliseconds, and 10, 30, 20, 50, you've got you know, something like 20 to 30 milliseconds of jitter. Uh, for some applications like email, totally fine. If you're doing real-time transaction processing, if you're doing voice, if you're doing sort of real-time applications, things that may need to buffer those packets or do something very quickly with them, uh, jitter can cause application issues. And so we'll, we'll talk about how we can actually reduce jitter as well. So the, the first sort of core concept is what's called the bandwidth delay product. So in this case, we've got two instances. Uh, they want to send traffic to each other. So this instance on the left wants to send traffic to the instance on the right and it's got this little data packet it's gonna to use to do that. So for just the purposes of argument, we're gonna say we have a big fat 10 gigabit uh, pipe here uh, to send between these two instances. Uh, but let's say that the delay is 500 milliseconds, which is also about how much time it takes to go to space, but for this example, let's not worry about the little details. Uh, so this data, in order for us to send more data, this other guy needs to tell us that he received the other uh, packet that we sent. So the acknowledgement needs to be sent back 
to us. Uh, and that also takes 500 milliseconds. So now it takes one second for us to send this one packet. So now, now we're capable of sending more packets to our, our friend over here on the right. Um, so you know, one second time is probably, unless you're dealing with satellite networks, probably not realistic. But we're going to use this just to make the math easy, because uh, I know it's late. And I'm, math might be hard right now. So, so what's the bandwidth here? So the, th the, the bandwidth is 10 gigabits per second. The throughput is however much data we actually put in that one packet that we got in that one second. Um, a normal size packet is 1,500 bytes. Let's say there's 100 bytes of overhead. So that's 1,400 bytes or 1.4 kilobits. So we've got a 10 gigabit pipe. We've got 1.4 kilobits per second of actual throughput, which sort of sucks. Uh, so how do we improve that? Uh, well, there's a couple, couple ways to do this. The first is let's just make that data packet bigger, right? So uh, in networking terms, we call this the, the maximum transmission unit, or MTU. Uh, so we can make that packet bigger. Unfortunately, that has its sort of limits. Uh, on the internet, 1,500 bytes is the, the norm. If you're using some sort of service provider, uh, 1,500 bytes is probably also the maximum. Uh, but in some cases, you can, you can increase that. What's more likely is you'll want to send more than one piece of data at a time. So in this case, you can do if we send three packets at once, now we send 4,500 bytes of data. Now we're up to 4.5 kilobits. And so you can sort of see how we get to you know, larger amounts of throughput with this. And this is the, the TCP window size that we can play with. So where does this stuff really matter? Uh, really sort of everywhere, because uh, it applies universally, like I said. But the places where it really matters is where the latency uh, is important. So if you're doing cross-region uh, connectivity and performance, it's important there because you're talking about like high orders of magnitude of, band of, of latency. So you know, hundreds or tens of milliseconds of bandwidth can sort of really impact your, your overall throughput. As well as if you have some sort of uh, application that's got uh, usually like clustering, uh, the type of high performance computing, um, elastic cache, memcache, these types of things are, are usually like clusters where a lot of times the bottleneck is actually how fast these things can talk to each other, um, often in the order of like microseconds. And so those types of scenarios, latency actually really matters. So how do we fix this? How do we improve it? There's sort of, I think there's two major ways. And by the way, the whole, the whole rest of this presentation is basically how do we fix these two things in these two ways. So one is tuning, right? So we can play with the algorithm itself. We can play with TCP. Uh, we can also set larger MTUs. Um, or we can, do, we can make the network more efficient. We can get rid of unnecessary packet processing. Uh, we can get rid of things that aren't efficient in the network. We can also try not to fight physics. Like speed of light's pretty, pretty hard to beat sometimes, uh, most of the time, all the time. So, so how do we do that? Well, that's just the name of the game of putting your instances and your resources in the right place. So this might be the case of using another AWS region. So that can you know, sort of reduce your milliseconds down to the tens of milliseconds, potentially from hundreds. Um, as well, you may want to think about, well, OK, well, I can put my instances in the same availability zone in the same region. Uh, and that's going to be, get me in the scale of you know, milliseconds in that same area. Uh, if I found that in some of these other cases we talked about where microseconds matter, then I probably want to look at a placement group. So uh, if you're not familiar, a placement group is uh, the ability for when you create instances for us inside of our infrastructure to basically put them like, physically close to each other. So you're in like the microsecond scale of, uh, of latency in a placement group. So we talked a little bit about tuning here. And I've, I've got a, a couple examples here. There's a really great session in the networking track. Uh, Mike Furr in net 401 is talking about how to make every packet count. So he goes into a lot of detail about how to really tune TCP. Uh, the great part about this is that you know, it applies to everything. TCP is everywhere. Uh, the problem with TCP is that it doesn't know anything. Uh, it, the, the same algorithms have really been in use for like 20 years, and, and the, each algorithm really knows nothing about your network. So every time it starts, it has to go find it, sort of find out what's out there, how much bandwidth is there, how much loss, those types of things. If you have some knowledge about your network, you know maybe how much bandwidth you have or how much loss you're expecting, or these types of things, you're able to tune the algorithm sort of parameters uh, for higher performance. So this first example here is the TCP receive window that says, you know, hey, I can accept maybe three packets at a time, or I can accept 100 or 1,000, um, and I've got some maximums there. So you can play with that timer, or sorry, the window. Uh, there's an initial congestion window, which is how many packets do I start off sending? Do I want to start off with one packet? Probably not, not in high performance networks. Um, and so you can increase that. Uh, you've also got TCP congestion control algorithms. 
So uh, some of them were like uh, Reno. I think there's actually one called Las Vegas, actually. Um, but effectively, this is like how aggressive is the timers and, and the, the fallback in most of the traditional TCP algorithms. If you lose one packet, you cut your congestion window by half, which basically takes your, your, your throughput in half. And so there's some different ways to handle that. And that there may be some better ones uh, for your environment. Uh, and also the TCP re retransmission timer. So if, if, you're, if you know you're in a fairly low latency scenario, you can actually reduce the, 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 re the retransmission timer so that you get more aggressive about sending packets if you have losses. So again, we're not going to go into a super lot of detail about these commands. If you want to dig into this, I suggest going and taking a look at that session. That was yesterday, I believe. Or sorry, it's tomorrow, I believe. Um, there's also a couple other sessions. So this session is dedicated just to network performance. Uh, so performance is an all-encompassing sort of topic. So if, if you're curious about uh, storage and I.O. and uh, memory and those types of optimizations, I would, I would suggest checking out a couple of these other sessions to, to go a little bit deeper. So I want to dig a little bit deeper on, on sort of packets per second in MTU. Uh, so it, again, it, like I said, a lot of people focus on bandwidth, but a lot of times that's not the right sort of metric to be looking at. And the, the whole name of this performance game is knowing which metrics matter for your application and, and your environment. So if you're doing things with small packets, so real-time data processing, transaction processing, um, you know, anything with small packets, uh, there's a pretty high chance that your, your bottleneck is actually the ability for that system to handle those packets. Either the underlying network uh, can't forward packets that rate, or your operating system or other things in your, your kernel won't be able to, to process that many packets. Uh, whenever uh, an operating system receives a packet, you know, there's a whole bunch of headers. There's MAC headers, there's an IP header, there's a TCP header, uh, there may be some other headers just like HTTP. Uh, so essentially, like, there's CC sorry, CPU threads and processes that need to, to look and sort of take all those things in, into account. Um, if, if you're seeing lots of small packets, that ends up becoming a, a pretty significant portion of the processing. Uh, and so in that scenario, that's where a larger MTU can actually help uh, increase your overall performance. Uh, so, you know, we can do up to 9,001 bytes inside a VPC or a peered VPC. So that increases the ratio of usable data to processing overhead. So in theory, if your application would took three or four packets to send the data it needed, it now can do that in one. So that's three or four times the processing overhead uh, that you can reduce. And so you, know, you probably want to test your application uh, for sort of this packets per second uh, limit, which you can usually do with like small packets or, or things like that. UDP is also uh, usually a better option for testing this type of th stuff as well. So. Let's talk about some of the AWS performance uh, things we can do. Bitfash, come on up, man. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Vishwesh Sahasravadar. Uh, I'm a senior product manager in EC2, responsible for instance networking and specifically network performance on instances. Um, so Nick provided an overview of what generally networking is, how you can improve performance uh, by tuning parameters, et cetera. I wanted to go into a bit more detail on what you can do specifically on EC2 to improve your network performance substantially. Um, so as you can guess, uh, we operate a pretty large network within regions, within availability zones. Um, what it means practically to you is that your performance is dependent on the size of your instance. So smaller instances get smaller network performance, larger instances get larger network performance. Our largest instances, for example, get 25 gigabits, the one below that gets 10 gigabits, and so on. Um, but so uh, you uh, are thinking about like what, we can, what you can do to enhance that performance. Uh, what is that one trick to get that enhanced networking performance? And what is that one trick? Guess what we call it? Enhanced networking. So what it means practically is it enhances your packet rate performance substantially. So our largest instances get well over 1 million packets per second performance when using enhanced networking. It also reduces instance-to-instance -instance latencies. So when you uh, run your instances um, within placement groups, within availability zones, uh, even within regions, you, you get substantially better performance when using enhanced networking. And how it does it practically is it gets the hypervisor out of the way. We use SRIOV, PCI pass-through kind of technologies to bypass the hypervisor and give you the raw underlying hardware performance straight to your instance. 
We have two versions of enhanced networking. Our older generation instances use the Intel IXGB EVF driver. Um, and recently, last year, actually, we announced and we released our own custom network device called the Elastic Network Adapter. Uh, there are a few reasons we built it, and I'll go into some more details. Uh, all our newer generation instances across most of our instance families come with uh, ENA. So what is enhanced networking? Um, typically, you're exchanging packets uh, between two instances in EC2. Um, how does that packet flow? Uh, in traditional virtualized networking, um, you take the packet, the packet goes through the virtualization layer using the Zen para-virtualized driver. So inside your instance, you get a Zen para-virtualized device. Uh, that packet goes through the virtualization layer to the underlying infrastructure. Um, uh, we do some VPC networking on it and send it along the way. The same process works in the reverse order on the other side, uh, and you get the packet delivered on, on the other instance. As you can see, the virtualization layer adds a lot of jitter because it does a lot of things, um, uh, not just networking. So what does enhanced networking do? It bypasses the virtualization layer. We use virtual functions from our underlying uh, hardware devices that are exposed uh, to your AC2 instances, and they are uh, used using the Intel driver in our previous generation instances. Um, when you instantiate using enhanced networking, that Intel driver talks directly uh, using the uh, virtual function to the underlying infrastructure, which does its VPC packet processing, sends it along. Removing that virtualization layer uh, removes a lot of the jitter uh, inconsistency that you see and enhances the packet rate performance as well. That leads to improvements in latencies as well as throughput. Um, so, as I said, that was the Intel driver. Um, as there are certain differences with ENA, and we go hint at some of the reasons that we launched uh, ENA. Um, first of all, it's a custom network device that marries well the software and the hardware from our Annapurna Labs division um, that's used, that makes the custom ASIC for our networking. Uh, marries that well together, we go deeper into, the, uh, into optimizing that performance. Um, and one of the reasons that we launched this is because it could deliver much higher performance than the 10 gigabits per second that was delivered by the Intel driver. When we launched enhanced networking, multiple generations of instances uh, provided 10 gigabits performance. When we wanted to go beyond that, we had to look at options. And what it turns out that if you use those drivers, you have to get a new driver for 20 gigabits, you have to get a new driver for uh, higher performance. We launched ENA with 20 gigabits performance on the X1 uh, last year. Um, this year, we actually enhanced the performance of all ENA devices um, on all ENA-enabled instances to 25 gigabits. Um, there was no intervention needed, no driver change needed. It was just available to you. So what are the ENA driver capabilities? Obviously, it gets you 20 gigabits. It gets you 25 gigabits. It's future-proof up to 400 gigabits. Now, that's not coming tomorrow or the next year, and so on, but it's nice to know that it's future-proof to that level. Uh, it increases the number of queues per device. So uh, the Intel driver had two queues per device, um, which were great for most applications, but for certain high-throughput, high-packet rate applications it, you, where you wanted to use multiple CPUs in, inside your instance, um, you wanted more queues. The ENA device provides eight queues um, per device. So per ENI, you can get eight queues. Um, it improves, even further improves uh, latency and jitter. Just enhanced networking gives you substantial improvements, and I will go into a bit more detail in future slides on what those uh, appear as. But ENA further improves latency and jitter. Um, and you're thinking like, okay, it's a Intel driver was available easily. Or what about ENA? We're actually happy to report that almost all operating systems, major operating systems that we provide using Amazon Machine Images uh, have inbuilt uh, ENA support uh, through their public images. It's available in Linux. Um, Amazon Linux had it from the start. It's now in Red Hat, uh, in SUSE, in multiple versions of Ubuntu. CentOS has it now, and if you so desire, if you have, if this does not cover the region, you have, uh, it's upstreamed into the Linux kernel, 
as well as the source code is available for you to use to compile your own version for your own operating system. Uh, we have broad support within Windows Server, uh, starting with 2008 R2, 2012, 2012 R2, and 2016. Um, we have drivers available for download if, if your uh, images did not have them initially. Um, and it's available on FreeBSD 11 as well. So across multiple operating system versions, across multiple operating systems, you have now broad ENA support. Okay, ENA is great. Um, so why enhanced networking in terms of, like, I want to go a little bit more detail into what sort of performance improvements you can see um, across the things that Nick talked about, bandwidth, latency, et cetera. So in the, <laughs> this slide shows the round trip time latencies um, that we typically see on EC2. These are all within a placement group, um, which we recommend for latency app sensitive applications. Um, it shows four generations of our compute optimized family. The last one that did not have enhanced networking was the CC2 8x large. You can see substantially high uh, latency numbers, more than 200 microseconds for the average, and in the worst case as well. So in the tail latencies as well as the average latencies which are relevant for your applications, uh, you can see substantially higher latency numbers. When we introduced C3, which was our first enhanced networking instance, we substantially cut down on latencies both for the average and the Latency, uh, and the worst case. Um, this continued improvement in C3 and C4, and now you can see with C5, um, we have further brought down the average latencies, as well as the worst case. Um, it's, it's a little harder to compare because they're across, but if you, if you look at the C5 18 extra large um, round trip latencies for the P99, uh, it is about the same as the average latencies for the C4. So that's a substantial improvement, and uh, it's compared, uh, compared the difference between the average and the worst case for C5 is also substantially improved. So that's about latencies. Um, what about throughput? <coughs> Excuse me. So um, as, I, as I was explaining, um, ENA allowed us to increase our throughput performance as well. We increased, we launched with 20 gigabits, we went to 25 gigabits. There were certain nuances that I wanted to capture in this slide. Um, if you look at C3 and C4, they provided you with 10 gigabit performance. Again, this is within a placement group. Um, for C5, uh, it provides you with aggregate 25 gigabits performance, but this, what this slide shows also is that a single TCP flow, um, or EDP flow for that matter, is limited in performance on how much you can get. This is pretty much the trend we are following since we launched ENA. We limit the performance of a single flow. There are certain nuances between a placement group and outside a placement group, which we'll cover later on. But practically, you uh, use a single flow in your testing, you will be limited to 10 gigabits. You change your settings to use multiple flows, you can easily get the peak performance of 25 gigabits. Um, this trend will continue across future generations as well, so we always recommend use multiple flows it's, um, it's, uh, to get the best performance. <laughs> so that was the peak performance that you can get for the largest instance size. I wanted to go into a bit more detail on uh, performance across, a, across instance sizes. You, um, if you're using the largest size, you get a certain level, but um, we also are able to provide you with up to 10 gigabits network performance for all instance sizes, practically. Um, the largest instance sizes get dedicated performance, while the small instance sizes get peak performance up to 10 gigabits. Again, the, as, as we explained before, the total network capacity of an instance um, is, depend, uh, is driven by the size of that instance. Uh, and the speeds are bidirectional, so in each direction you can get this performance dedicated and uh, separate. Uh, instances also have dedicated storage throughput. Now obviously this is network performance focused, but we wanted to highlight this because um, there are certain instance families where you did not get that performance. Um, we have EBS, which was our network storage device. Um, you can guess we use the same um, network infrastructure, uh, but from an e instance perspective, uh, what that means is either you get a single pipe that drips gives you both network and storage, which was the case with C3, 8 extra large. Here, a 10 gigabits pipe that 
that was used for both network and storage. With C4, we made enhance, uh, we made EBS optimize the default without any extra charges. So you got a dedicated 10 gigabits pipe plus additional bandwidth for, for storage. Now with C5, as you can see, we have more than doubled both the network as well as the storage throughput. You don't have to think about your application, is it network bound or storage bound? They're, they're not going to be together affecting each other. They're going to be independently can scale. Okay, so enhanced networking is great. How do I, how do I get it? Uh, probably, uh, we hope that everyone would want to use enhanced networking from now. Um, since you're in an optimizing network performance class, I'm sure you would love to use it. Um, as we said, instances will either support the old school Intel IXGBF driver or the ANA driver. You listed all the instance families, this keeps growing, so by the end of the week it might have different instances, but um, it, will keep, uh, it will keep changing. But the trend is typically that our older generation, for example, the older compute optimized family C3 and C4 had, had the Intel drivers, the latest one C5 had the ENA, same for R3 versus R4 and so on. This trend will continue our all uh, our new generation families, most of our new generation families would start supporting uh, ENA. So, uh, you would want to use that. If you're planning to use it in R4, for example, it will benefit you across uh, using it for C5 and so on. Um, AMIs must support the correct version. For Intel, there's a specific version that you require. Uh, for ENA, any version will do. Um, and in terms of making sure that the plumbing is done properly, you need to make sure your instance and AMI attributes are set to enable enhanced networking. And I'll go into a bit more detail on how that is done. Um, all the OS images that I had covered for ENA already have these settings set done. So out of the box, if you launch those public images through your quick start menu or community army, et cetera, you'll get that performance uh, automatically. You don't have to do anything. You can verify that the instance is working with ENA and this command will show you whether ENA support is enabled or not. Um, and you can verify before launching the instance whether the army that you want to launch with has ENA support or not. You have a CLI image as well as within our quick start on the console, it highlights whether ENA support is enabled um, uh, in the image. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, as I was explaining, um, a broad public, a broad public army OS image support. Um, what if your uh, what if your operating system does not have it? If you're using an older version, um, if you're using a custom, you can take the um, uh, you can take the ENA driver, build uh, 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 build the ENA kernel driver in your instance, install it, uh, modify the instance attribute, stop and start the instance, and you're all set. Uh, you can do the same steps as creating an, uh, creating an image, and that will automatically pick up that attribute and make sure that you can reproducibly deploy it without going through these steps again. Um, similar uh, commands work for IXGBVF. Um, it's, it's a little different in that we had a different uh, attribute that was used, uh, signifying the technology, SRIOV. Um, if you don't have it enabled, it shows that it's blank. If you have it enabled, we call it simple um, for some reasons. Um, uh, the same command works to show uh, whether your army has uh, uh, SRI vignette support enabled. <coughs> so um, <coughs> having all those steps um, either verifying it within your army or verifying it within uh, on the instance attribute ensures that we do the plumbing uh, to make sure ENA support is enabled. Uh, how do you verify it inside your operating system inside the instance? You can run this simple command. Um, if you have the para virtualized driver, it will show up as the virtual interface. Uh, if you have the Intel driver on these specific instances, it will show up as IXGBVF. Uh, if you have the ENA driver, um, it will show up as uh, ENA. Uh, one nuance to note here is that C5 um, is using our 
next generation hypervisor, which implements all our networking, storage, and hardware. So it won't have the support for the virtual interface. Um, it will only have ENA support. So you need to make sure that, uh, that um, the uh, machine image that you use for launching C5 uh, has that image, uh, has that support pre-built. Uh, as you can see, most of our public images do, so just go, launch away and enjoy. Um, I'll hand over to Nick to go into a bit more details on improving network performance. Sure, thanks. So, um, you know, some of the folks that I work with uh, want to go sort of even further, like down the rabbit hole, right? So uh, beyond enhanced networking, uh, there's another project out there called uh, DPDK, or uh, the, the Data Plane Development Kit. Uh, effectively, this is a C, C library and set of um, code that you can, you can use to get even higher network performance. And so this, you can do this on-premises, you can do this in other environments. Uh, so this is not something specific to AWS, but, uh, but you can use it on AWS, so it's compatible with the Intel driver and the ENA driver. <coughs> Uh, so some of the benefits here is that you can get even lower latency. Um, you can get higher control over the packets and queuing and some of those kinds of things. So the, some of the use cases I see this are around uh, packet processing devices. So for instance, like in the voice over IP world session border controllers or um, like the Cisco router that we use in the transit VPC uh, actually utilizes DPDK. So it's, you know, it's, it's really about getting the, the highest possible uh, performance in, in, even in a multi-platform environment. So the way this works, if we go back to some of the slides that Vishesh had here, uh, so on the left here, we've now got an instance running on this host. Um, and inside that, there's, an app, there's some application code and a kernel, right? so our operating system. Uh, the way this stuff works, typically, is that the application uses the kernel level networking. So it goes through the kernel level networking that has the driver, like some of the enhanced drivers that uh, we were just talking about. And that's, that's how normal networking works. Uh, what DBDK does is, so now if we use those libraries, and we, you know, it does re require rewriting our application, so it's not quite as simple as like <laughs> turning on an instance attribute. Um, but if you're really serious about this and your application is compatible with these concepts, um, you can rewrite your application with some of the DPDK libraries. And that basically gives that application uh, direct access to the hardware. So it gets direct access to the network NIC here. So it, it has a little more control over things like the receive queues and transmitting and um, those kinds of things. And it also reduces some of the kernel switching. So, you know, the DBDK app is running in user space and there's the operating system space there. So typically what ends up happening is when a packet goes through that processing engine, it, you know, it, there's a lot of like delay and uh, those kinds of things. In this scenario, there's, it goes directly to the hardware NIC. And so that's where you're really even further reducing jitter and latency. Uh, and like I said, that additional control. Uh, so it's supported on the, like I said, the Intel driver, the ENA. Uh, it's also what's called a pull mode driver or PMD. Uh, that basically means that it's, uh, it doesn't have to wait for interrupts. And so that actually reduces some of the CPU scheduling uh, for problems that can happen. Uh, one of the, uh, and also it doesn't, doesn't necessarily change any AWS you know, things. If you enable enhanced networking with the ENA driver, you know, you get additional sort of uh, latency and packet rates and those kinds of things. If you enable DPDK, the underlying AWS infrastructure doesn't change. You're just really making your instance that much more efficient. Uh, and one little, one little snag here that I do want to document is if, if you enable DPDK on an Intel uh, driver, you'll, you'll receive packets with 802.1Q uh, frame on there, and you just need to strip that. So if you send this, that same frame back with that same VLAN tag, it, it actually won't go anywhere. So if you're playing with this stuff, that's sort of important to know. So we've been talking a lot of theory. Uh, we've talked a little about customer use cases, but let's, let's talk about something real. Um, so Supercell, uh, these folks make uh, games, so you may be familiar with Clash of Clans. What's behind Clash of Clans is a distributed architecture. Uh, it's a set of you know, front ends, middle tier, storage. You know, it looks you know, pretty familiar in that, that vein. Sometimes it's easy to forget it's a game, I think. Uh, but it's made up of you know, hundreds of instances that have thousands of TCP connections. And last year, Supercell migrated off of EC2 Classic onto VPC. And that enabled them to use newer instance types that had enhanced networking enabled. So 100% uh, of the instances they're using are on enhanced networking. And so what they were seeing in the EC2 Classic environment was that when they did upgrades or patches or uh, reloads, those kinds of things, that it took about 30 minutes for all the networking connections to stabilize and for everything to sort of come up. 
Uh, <clears throat> with enhanced networking, they were able to get that down to less than one minute. So that was a huge improvement for them. Um, the other, there were some other operational benefits. Uh, so from a monitoring perspective, things were sort of more flat and more stable. Um, their database connections didn't flap as often. Uh, message queue depths were lower. And generally, operations people were just sort of happier. Uh, but the, the sort of cool part of this story is that it had a customer impact. So uh, they were able to take their maintenance downtimes down from one hour down to 20 minutes. So you're know, actually getting people back into the game faster. Uh, so this, all this dorky networking stuff actually meant something to somebody, which is, always makes me happy. So uh, let's talk network performance architectures. So for the most part, what we've talked about is if you have two instances that want to talk to each other inside the same VPC, you know, what does that look like? What are the benefits? Placement groups and those kinds of things. Um, a lot of the architectures I work with are, are not that. There are other things. Um, you know, there are things like accessing or pulling data from S3, or you're coming in over a VPN or Direct Connect, or your instance is behind a load balancer, or uh, maybe it isn't a placement group. So let's take a look at sort of you know, what impacts that has on your network performance. So let's start with, uh, let's start with one of my favorite ones. Um, I get this one pretty often, which is you know, like, hey, how much bandwidth can I get out of my VPC? Uh, the answer is, as much as you want. There's no VPC-specific limit. There's, you know, we say VPC is your virtual data center in the cloud. Um, and whenever I think data center, I think, okay, well, there's got to be some limit there somewhere. Uh, but in this case, it's, it's a logical construct. So go nuts. It's going to basically scale up and scale down with however many instances and, and sort of bandwidth you throw at it. Uh, additionally, uh, your subnets and availability zones also don't have any sort of performance limits. Uh, we don't run layer two in our subnets. So you also don't have to worry about things like large broadcast domains. Or if I, you can create, as scary as it sounds, you can create like a slash 15 subnet. Uh, or I guess slash 17 because 16 is the, the maximum. But you can create very large subnets and you're not going to run into performance problems uh, from any sort of layer two traffic in at least. Uh, as well, uh, the internet gateway, like I said, I'm a network guy. When I think gateway, I think it's going to be like a box and that box is going to eventually break or fall over because that's what boxes do. Uh, Internet Gateway is not a box. It's a, it's a logical construct. So you can send as much traffic to and from your Internet Gateway. So you get one Internet Gateway per VPC, and that's enough. You don't have to worry about it. You don't have to manage it. It's not going to fall over. It's, again, a logical construct that basically allows you to route to the Internet over our sort of distributed set of architectures and, and infrastructure. Uh, NAT Gateway is similar. Uh, it's not quite as unlimited. Uh, there's going to be some later talks this week about how this works, which is super interesting. Uh, but effectively, uh, NAT Gateway runs on a distributed networking state machine. So NAT is the process of basically keeping track of which ports and IP addresses are sort of talking to each other. Uh, we do that across a distributed state of EC2 instances. Uh, and the cool part about that is we run a very cost-effective uh, state machine that uh, can scale, it can handle a aggregate sustained throughput of uh, 10 gigabits per second and scale horizontally beyond that as well. Uh, so from an availability perspective, the NAT gateway is specific to one availability zone. So if you're going to use the NAT gateway, we do recommend for you to have a uh, NAT gateway in each availability zone. So that's going to further increase your performance there. Another common question is uh, VPC peering. How much bandwidth can I get through that? And this is another one I like to answer because I get to say whatever you want. Um, there's, no, there's no sort of inherent VPC peering limit. Uh, from our perspective, this just looks like traffic within the same VPC. So there's no magic fiber, no magic cable, it's not going to fall apart. Uh, so you can sort of go nuts with VPC peering. If we talk about inside the VPC, well, you know, where are the limits? So inside a placement group, uh, you can get up to 25 gigabits per second. That's on the ENA enabled instances. On the IXG BVF instances, you're, you can get up to 10 gigs. Uh, and you know, historically, to get those numbers, you had to be in the placement group. Uh, with ENA, uh, we actually extended this to other availability zones as well. So you don't have to be in the placement group to get that up to that 25 gigabits per second number, which you know, that's really exciting news. Uh, so that really increases the availability because placement groups are specific to one availability zone. So that's, that's a great way to increase performance. Uh, additionally, if you're maybe running a big data application or something like that, and you're pulling a lot of data from S3, uh, that's a very common use case for, for us. Uh, you know, whether you're doing this over VPC endpoints or you're doing this over public IP addresses for S3, uh, 
those bandwidth limits have also been increased with ENA. So you can get up to 25 gigabits per second of raw network performance to those IP addresses. Um, you know, that doesn't necessarily mean you'll get those because you, know, you still have to worry about packet sizes, MTUs, and those kinds of things. Uh, so you may be sort of rate limited at that component based upon how large your object sizes are and um, other components, but network throughput is, is no longer the bottleneck. So these are also aggregate limits. If we talk about individual flow limits, like some of the slides that we had up there around throughput, then in a placement group, you do have an advantage of having that 10 gigabits per second for a single flow. Uh, outside of a placement group, it's going to be 5 gigabits per second. So sort of the, the takeaway from this is, you know, placement groups are cool and all, but if you're not using them, it's actually better to use multiple instances uh, if, you're, if you're wanting to get really high bandwidths. Uh, that way we can distribute that load out. And for all the flows that we didn't have a pretty slide for, you're going to have an aggregate 5 gigabit per second flow there as well. So again, let's talk about things outside the VPC. So you've got something, uh, a data center, and you want to come in over VPN or Direct Connect. What does that look like? What type of performance are we talking about? So our virtual private gateway is a managed VPN service. So you can create a VPN connection. And in that VPN connection, you get two VPN tunnels. Uh, by default, we're going to advertise a slightly less good metric over one of those tunnels. And so all your traffic is going to be flowing over one tunnel. That's just the way the, the default BGP metrics work. Uh, each one of those tunnels, and there's two in a, uh, in a VPN connection, uh, can handle 1.25 gigabits per second. Uh, so in theory, you know, if you're crafty with BGP and you like tweaking that kind of stuff, you can, um, you can probably double that for a total VPN connection. But, you know, for the mere mortals of us that deal with BGP every day, um, you know, 1.25 is, is probably where you're going to be at. If you come in over Direct Connect, um, this is another one I like to answer because the virtual private gateway, again, it sounds like a box, sounds like it would fail over, it won't. Um, it, the only bandwidth limit there is the physical port speeds. So uh, you have to worry about the physical port speeds only. So we offer you know, sub one gig, one gig, and 10 gig ports. Uh, we also allow you to do link aggregation. So you can bundle up to four ports together. So that means for a, a single physical port, you can get up to 40 gigs. If you want to go into the hundreds of gigabits of second, just buy more ports. Uh, we've got customers doing that. Cool. Uh, you know, it still should be noted that if you're doing hundreds of gigabits of direct connect ports, uh, any given instance still has this egress uh, five gigabit per second aggregate limit. So again, more reason to think about putting more instances out rather than trying to find the biggest, baddest instance you can possibly find. Uh, speaking of that, uh, load balancing. So for those that may not be familiar, we've launched a new load balancer called the Network Load Balancer, or, or NLB. It's the latest addition to the Elastic Load Balancing family of instances, or load balancers. Uh, you know, this is, this is great because it's offered a couple more features. Uh, so it's our, sort of our not HTTP load balancer. So if you're doing HTTP stuff, you may want to use the application load balancer because uh, it's got more HTTP features like path routing and some of those kinds of things. Uh, so this is a TCP-based load balancer. It's got some nice features. Uh, for instance, it has a single IP address per availability zone. So it sort of mimics the, the virtual IP functionality you may be sort of uh, used to. Um, it also, from a performance perspective, when you send traffic to that IP address of that availability zone, it's going to keep the traffic within that availability zone. So if you're worried about things like microseconds and, and really you know, keeping track of the, the, the latest latency, um, you'll see lower latency there. But the, the real reason this thing's on the slide is the performance perspective. So if, if you guys have been sort of with AWS for a while and uh, we're doing elastic ELBs, which we're now calling classic load balancers, uh, you, you realize that like, you know, they, they take time to scale up. Um, and there were some pre-warming scenarios and those kinds of things. Uh, with network load balancer, you don't have to worry about that. So sort of even to begin with, uh, when you first put your first instance behind the network load balancer, you'll get multiple gigabits of capacity at launch. So that's more bandwidth than what most websites ever need. Um, it also scales horizontally. So if you go beyond that, um, it's going to grow with you. So to, to put this in perspective, here's a graph that uh, one of the, the folks here did a test with. So we're running a distributed test <coughs> uh, tool. And so basically, it, it runs a distributed set of instances. Each one of those instances is sending 100 connections per second to a set of web servers that we set up. And so at launch, cold start, uh, this was doing over 100,000 transactions per second. 
Uh, we had that sort of incrementally scale up. And then at some point, uh, this red line here is actually the network load balancer's sort of performance. So it's doing fine. There were no errors. We weren't timing out on load balancing, any of those sort of things. Uh, we actually went over the capacity of our web servers. So we added some more capacity to our web servers. Network load balancer kept up fine. Still no errors. We probably could have kept on going, but at that point, we were at 30 gigabits per second. So we're like, that's probably enough bandwidth. Uh, so the network load balancer uh, has enough capacity to scale into the hundreds of gigabits per second if you have that type of workload. If you care more about network load balancer and getting into that, there's another session, Net 304. Highly recommend that as well. So let's, let's go into testing a little bit. Um, testing story where, where the metal is important, right? So we've talked about sort of a lot of concepts here. Uh, we talked about sort of your application profile, right? What sort of application and what sort of protocols is it using? What sort of packet sizes? Uh, what sort of instance types and family are you on? What sort of MTU are you playing with? Um, is this inside a placement group? Is it not? Um, is it TCP? Uh, there's a lot of aspects to what will define your performance that you're going to expect. So, you know, that's, that's one of the reasons why, you know, it's hard to find good performance numbers uh, because there's so many factors here that can, can come into your application. So what we recommend doing is to test it. And that's sort of a nativist mantra as well as, you know, we bill you by the second now. So, <laughs> you know, we try to make it very easy for you to go out and test these things yourself. So when you get out to, to testing, the types of things you want to think about are maybe sort of the scenarios and the types of testing. So if you can test with your own application sort of, you know, as it is, uh, that's great. Uh, especially considering a, a lot of migrations are coming into AWS, a lot of things are changing, right? You may be going from a SAN to Elastic Block Store. You may be changing networking to you know, VPC. There's a lot of changes going on, so testing is really uh, the best way to get a feel for what that's going to look like. Uh, but you may want to do a certain, certain different types of tests. You may want to see how much load you can put on your system. Or you may want to see um, you know, your transaction numbers or how many TPSs you can do. So try some very small amount of data and see how fast you can send that before it falls over. That way you know where that limit's at. Uh, you may also want to do some of these, what I like to call racetrack numbers, right? So numbers that you probably wouldn't see in production, uh, but numbers that give you an idea of what, where the maximums and the limits are. So you want to do those sort of testing. Uh, you want to probably test different scenarios and a couple different types of tests. So the type of scenarios you may want to test are, you know, the placement group or non-placement group, or on-premises from VPN versus Direct Connect, or if you're coming over the internet over SSH or something like that. You may want to test those scenarios and then find out which of these numbers really matter for you. Is it a bandwidth thing? So you can test with very large packet sizes and MTUs. Um, or is it latency? So there's a specific set of latency testing tools that are probably more accurate uh, that can give you like millisecond or microsecond sort of accuracy of, of what sort of latency you're dealing with. Uh, you want to make sure that enhanced networking is on for all this because sort of like we said earlier, there's no disadvantage to turning on advanced networking. Uh, we spend a lot of time <laughs> going over how to check if it's on because we've found a lot of people think it's on and it's not, so make sure it's actually on. Um, you know, the throughput testing is important uh, to, to see how it compares to your overall bandwidth abilities. Uh, and also if, if you think your you know, packets per second are limiting you, um, you know, if your packet sizes are under, I'll call it 600, 700 bytes, uh, you probably want to see what your packets per second uh, limits look like. So, uh, you know, when I do testing, I test a lot with iPerf. Uh, there's a lot more advanced tools out there, and if you know about them, you're probably better at testing than I am. <laughs> uh, but, you know, there's a couple easy things to do with iPerf to sort of test out your limits. So if your application is, you know, running over a single port and you think you might be running into bandwidth limits, test out maybe iPerf with the, the capital dash P. Uh, that will split it into parallel threads. Usually five or 10 is more than enough to, to sort of figure out where that, where that limit's actually at. Uh, as well, if you're worried about like the throughput or the latency aspects, uh, throw UDP at it, because UDP is not gonna slow down and wait for a response before it sends more packets. Uh, so it's easier to flood a, sort of a pipe or a network and determine where that maximum is. So it's less sensitive to latency and uh, packet loss. So it's easier for doing bandwidth testings in some scenarios. And that's the, uh, the lowercase u to put in UDP. And you can do a dash lowercase p to figure out the port number. You have to run the server side of this as well. Uh, that's why we've got this sort of tool or this uh, link at the bottom, which has a, a more in-depth sort of iPerf uh, example for performance testing. Uh, and if you're doing some really large bandwidth tests, uh, you probably also want to look at uh, some sort of distributed tool here. So I've got a link here to an open source tool that we use 
So you know, some of the, some of the takeaways here, um, you know, one, understand those core concepts, the, the, the relationship between latency and bandwidth and package per second, because that's sort of underlying uh, this whole thing. Um, you know, understand what we can do in AWS to help you out. So uh, Jumbo, Jumbo MTUs are enabled by default. So all you really have to do is enable that in your instances. So that's an easy thing to go check. Make sure that's compatible with your service providers because it could create uh, packet fragmentation if, it's not, if you try to enable Jumbo, Jumbo MTUs over Direct Connect or over the internet. Uh, like I said, make sure enhanced networking is actually on. Um, it should be, double check. Uh, and try when you're doing the testing, try out the different, maybe different instance families. Uh, so, for instance, you know the C4 and the C5 have, you know, we've shown different networking capabilities. So it's worth testing out different instance types and families. If you think you're you're being limited on packets per second or bandwidth or throughput or whatever it is, uh, try a slightly larger instance type uh, and see what ask, you know, what that does to your application. Um, and then also some of the architectural stuff. You know, we, we gave you a lot of guidance here on sort of where our limits are at. Um, hopefully you don't run into those, but uh, knowing what sort of things you can do to improve that performance is, is always helpful. And you know, again, we'll say it again, test it out. Um, test, test, test. Uh, I think that's the whole point of this whole performance testing stuff. Half it's knowing the theory and the other part's actually figuring out how to get it, how to get it done. So um, that's what I've got. Uh, if you guys are interested in the official uh, networking certification, myself and some other networking people have written a book. Um, it's going to be available February next year. So uh, I've also put some stickers out there. So if you need a networking sticker, grab one. They should be sort of around. So thank you, everybody, for, for staying late.